James, how you doing? Dave, how are you? I'm doing really good. What's what's been going on? Oh man, what ha I'm I'm finer than frogs here. What hadn't been going on? We are uh, we're getting ready to uh, Louisville is hosting a WWF pay per view on Sunday. Uh, we have a big event at the Louisville Gardens with Ohio Valley Wrestling uh, coming up on June 23rd. Uh, we've got a new uh, broadcast affiliate here in the Louisville market, the WB affiliate, that is uh, actually now the most powerful uh, WB affiliate in terms of their transmitter in the United States. They're beaming to over one million homes in the area, and uh, we are just uh, we're in the process of talking to them about a two-hour uh, special on Saturday night, the night before the Garden Show. That would be June seventeenth. Really, um, a and, wrestling type thing? Uh, yes, it's going to be a preview. Wow. Of the the Garden's event is called the Rock and Rumble. That's on Friday night, June twenty-third, and we ha we are going to have a uh, two-hour special as a preview to it on the WB station here in Louisville on Saturday night. I believe it's June seventeenth. So everything's going excellent. Um, have you have you noticed uh, a big difference? I mean, how many weeks have you been on the WB? Because I noticed you mentioned was it three four weekends now. Uh, yeah, this that? weekend will be the fourth show. Okay, and have you noticed a difference as far as just response? So um, far? Yeah, quite a bit. A lot more people, and, and also uh, the Gardens event is a co-promotion with Clear Channel Radio here in town, and they own the top two rock stations uh, in town, along with six other radio stations. And we have a couple of their on-air personalities that are becoming uh, uh, recurring personalities on our television program. So over the past couple of weeks, uh, everybody in town is well. I can't say everybody; that would be a slight exaggeration. There's probably a couple of sick and shut-ins that aren't talking about us, but uh, a lot of people are talking about OVW. I just got off the. Uh, WHAS News, which is the ABC affiliate here in town, uh, did a, uh, a little thing on the WWF coming in and their uh, relationship with Ohio Valley. And uh, so uh, we're getting a, a ton of mainstream publicity in this town over the past few weeks. Now, as far as, you know, one of the main thing, things of Ohio Valley, maybe even the main thing, is, is, a, is a territory for development of uh, WWF uh, personnel. And, and you're basically getting the guys... You know, first, you know, firsthand. I mean, when they go to the other places, they may have experience. You're getting guys, in many cases, with no experience. Yeah, and you have some guys that have a lot of experience. Of the, of the newer guys, I mean, what's kind of your feeling on guys that maybe not, have never even had a match? that you think maybe someday we should look out for, like, I don't know, like a Shelton Benjamin or some people like that? Uh, yeah, well, I was going to mention his name. Actually, all of the guys that we've got here right now, with the exception of uh, a young man named Randy Orton, who's Bob Orton Jr.'s son, uh, he actually has not even started yet. Uh, he came down and made a class and, and found a place to live, and he'll be back in soon. Everybody that we've got has had at least a couple of matches now. Uh, you know, one guy uh, that, that we've got in training who has a tremendous look uh, named Dave Batista tore his bicep in training real early, and he is uh, in the process of rehabbing that. But he even had a couple of matches. So everybody's had a couple of matches now, even though they're in the middle of their training. And and uh, I think we've got some tremendous prospects. Shelton Benjamin, I think, is going to be uh, probably the, the star of the class. Uh, he was a NCAA All-American. Um, he uh, actually was... Uh, one of the wrestling coaches at the University of Minnesota, and uh, just a tremendous athlete, great body, and, and really has the eye for professional wrestling, and has been a fan all his life. Grew up in North Carolina watching Ric Flair, and uh, so you can't have any better uh, you know, role model than that, and I think he's going to be the star of the class. This guy's a natural, and he, he's going to be phenomenal. He's been training now probably two and a half months, and, and you know, I, I just have tremendous hopes for him. The uh, poll question for today or for yesterday was, which of these should should be the strongest candidate for this year's Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame? And I was very, I will say, I was very surprised at the results. Um, we got five choices here. And uh, anyway, number the first choice was Steve Austin, who got six percent, Chris Benoit, who got six percent, Mick Foley, who got forty-five percent, Shinya Hashimoto got five percent, and Shawn Michaels got thirty-nine percent. And if it was me, just my opinion. Um, and this is nothing against any of the, any of the other guys because they all deserve, to me they all deserve it, but to me Austin stands out. Austin's the biggest wrestling star of our era, and I mean I might put Foley second, but I couldn't put anyone ahead of Austin. I don't know. What do you think, Jim? Well, what was your criteria uh, for the, that? Was for the Hall of Fame? For the Hall of Fame. Um, I thought the Hall of Fame criteria was they had to be in the business a certain amount of time. Blah 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 blah. 
Yeah, well, these are guys who are all past 35 now. Oh, okay, for Sean. okay. I wasn't looking at age. I was looking at, at years in the business. Well, certainly, yeah, then I'm surprised at, at Austin's low percentage. And I'm surprised at Shawn Michaels' is high percentage, but a lot of those people must not know him personally. But uh got to say that, uh, I, you know, I can't argue with anybody choosing Mick Foley, and obviously that's a sentimental choice based on Austin may be the biggest wrestling star of uh, this or any other era, for that matter, in terms of revenue from all sources. But, you know, Mick Foley is just uh, – he is – of all uh, athletes, of all stars in this business in history, I think he is the one that's connected with people as just a guy that you want to like as a friend. That's the only way I can describe it. I, I, think, I, would, I would agree. I think he has that quality that comes through no matter what, and uh, I think that's probably why he would get a, a high vote as well as his talent. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think everyone likes him. I think I think he absolutely belongs on for on a lot of levels uh, you know in the book the book being the icing on the cake but even without the book i think he belongs but somehow if, if i was going to pick one guy of that five i just think that austin's credentials i mean you know it's a guy who i mean he, he carried the business mick foley was and and you know i mean he carried the business to its its probably greatest level of success and maybe rock will surpass him and and you know and all that, but but um, Fo you know Foley was a guy who was there with him, but he wasn't the guy carrying the thing. And uh, Michaels uh, was one of the guys on top during a period where things weren't quite as good. And in, in the ring, you know, I mean, Shawn Michaels, phenomenal performer in the ring. Uh, you know, I would say better performer in the ring than than Austin. But if you look at you know like carrying the business, turning the WWF around. Right. And it wasn't Michaels who did it. It was Austin who did it. I, I think uh, you've got a, an element there of people say, okay, Mick is retired, and, and even if Mick does come back for, for some type of special event or something or, uh, you know, whatever in the future, still we've seen, you know, Mick's closing moments as, as the Mick Foley that we remember, you know, due to physical conditioning, and et cetera. And, and whereas I think they still think that uh, Austin has – has another day, and, and hopefully he will, because you know it's a shame to see a guy, uh, even if he obviously doesn't need the money, it doesn't need the recognition. It's it's a shame to see a guy, uh, you know, end his career that early. So I'm I'm sure that Austin will have another go round or two. Okay, um, I also want to make mention that this is our question for the weekend's poll. It is: Do you think WCW has been guilty or not uh, 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 guilty of not giving ethnic minority talent a fair chance? A Yes, across the board. B, yes, in some cases because they had closed minds. C, not really sure. D, not really, maybe with an exception. E, absolutely not. So, anyway. Does, does minority based. talent include great wrestlers who are not friends of Eric Bischoff's or Vince Russo's? <laughs> I think we're just using ethnic minorities this week. <laughs> <laughs> but I know so, WCW has added so many minority groups to, to the standard ones because basically, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Malenko, Benoit, Guerrero, and the earlier, uh, you know, in the earlier segment, uh, there's a lot of minorities in WCW now, including poor guys who are never going to get a break because they're not the right size, they don't live next door to the right people. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I want to go through this. I hadn't actually read this, but this is from J.S. Dillon, which is not J.J. Dillon, and it just goes, I know you're a big fan of the show Friends, as am I. Um, actually, you know, for whatever this is worth, I thought the episode of Frasier last night was tremendous. Friends was all right. Um, I, I rarely watch those shows, but it was the season finales, and obviously looking at the ratings those two shows did, they were through the roof, so I didn't watch as much of SmackDown as usual. But anyway, I, for the rest of the summer, I don't have to watch any of those shows, just SmackDown. Anyway, watching the season finale last night, I began thinking about how the big three bookers would have fin written the finish for the show. Vince would have booked it exactly the way it ended. Chandler would have gotten Monica, the fans and viewers would have been sent home happy. If Paul Heyman was booking, the six stars would have resigned, and he would have had the audience chanting, you sold out, you sold out of them during the whole show. <laughs> And if Vince Russo had booked it, neither Richard or Chandler would have gotten Monica as David Arquette would have come in and snagged her just to play off a real-life story. It made no sense. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I, and, and, and Russo would have beat the other guys up with a baseball bat. <laughs> I was thinking he was going to say that Russo would have gotten her, but actually his, his makes more sense. I also want to really quickly mention, and this was an interesting question here, too. Um, the XFL is going to be on Sunday nights on UPN, 7 to 10 p.m., uh, during uh, the February through April, so that would mean that you once it would be going the XFL games would be going head to head with WWF pay per views once a month and with uh, WCW and ECW pay per views because the same time slot right because the pay per views are eight to eleven. So uh, yes, they will be going head to head. Um, so I don't know what that means. I guess we'll find out. Uh, I guess we'll find out. Um, 
Oh, we got a full bank of calls. I have this giant stack of emails for you, so we'll go to the calls first. We'll go to Fred in New Jersey. You're first up with Jim Cornette. Hey, how you doing, Jim? How you doing, Dave? I'm, uh, doing, I'm doing good. Uh, this past week, I was rating who I feel are the top five best interviewers that I've ever heard, and I came up with Mick Foley at one, Jim Cornette at two, then uh, Ric Flair, Steve Austin, and uh, The Rock. I was Arne Anderson. God, God, Arne Anderson. God bless you, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Arne Anderson. Well, yeah, where's Arne? You know, Arne Anderson. I, I wanted to put Anderson in place of The Rock. It's just the reaction that The Rock gets from his interviews is so tremendous. That's why I put The Rock ahead of Anderson. I can't argue with you there. <laughs> and, 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 and I think, actually, The Rock doesn't even get the reaction from his interviews. The Rock goes out and gets a reaction and does an interview. He's going to get a reaction if he stands there and smiles. Yeah, or just raises his eyebrow. I think that Rock, Rock reminds me of, um, and even more so, um, of what I, years and years ago, um, this is like early 80s, I remember we used to joke that Michael Hayes could read a phone book and get a great reaction for his interviews, whereas like other guys actually had to do good interviews. Um, I think Piper was even close to that because Piper like sometimes made no sense, but people would think it was a great interview. I think Rock, more than any wrestler ever, could come out literally with a phone book and start reading it, and people would say it was, a, and, and they would react to it like it was a great interview. And I don't think. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think Jim Cornette could get away with that one. <laughs> no, no, not not unless the phone book contained a, a, a lot of people whose last names ended in, uh, you know, one-line or punchline. But uh, <laughs> I appreciate the ranking. I'm just I'm going to be looking out for Flair and Austin and Rock to lay the smack down, put the figure four on, and uh, give me the stunner if they ever catch up to me when they hear that. <laughs> Jim, let me ask you, uh, anytime soon, are we going to be seeing you back on WWF TV? Um, only if it's shot in Louisville. Uh, I, my, my immediate and long-term plans include never leaving the city limits except if absolutely necessary. Uh, you're disappointing me now. Uh, but, but you can get Ohio Valley Wrestling tapes on ovwrestling.com. Go to the website, and then you can, you can buy me on videotape. Okay. I, I'll make sure I do that. I already have your shoot tapes from our video. I think they're fantastic. I, truthfully, I don't even remember which one that is, but, but if it's me and it's great, I'll, I'll take the compliment. Actually, you made three of them. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Hey, in fact, you're in one of them, too, Dave. Uh, I'm in one of them? That may have been one of the Smoky Mountain Fan Week tapes. Oh, okay. That, right. that may be what that is, because I, I don't recall actually doing something on purpose for Rob, but <laughs> that I don't want to think because I wouldn't, but, you know, just, it just didn't happen. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, guys. It was good talking to you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, Fred. Let's go to Matt in Vancouver. Matt, you're next up. Hi. How's it going? It's going good. Really hey, good. Jim. How's it going? Very good. Um, I, there's this question that's been bugging me for so long. They they said that there's heat between you and Paul Heyman. I'd like to know how that started and if it's real. Oh um, my. Well, first of all, it started know, when they were. It started on the day they were both born. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I, I was born a small black child in a log cabin. And, no, um, uh, basically, uh, Paulie and I had. Um, you know, competitive spirit in WCW, which, you know, or in the NWA slash WCW, whatever, you know, at that point, which led to real heat after he uh, basically lied to me on a couple of occasions. And, and, you know, a dog barks, a cat meows. I don't know why I would think Paulie wouldn't lie, but, you know, it, it was over the gangsters thing uh, when, when they left Smoky Mountain and went to ECW. And, and yes, it's real. And, and also I have heat with him on his philosophies for creating an atmosphere where, uh, you know, today's some of today's great talents have to maim themselves while he sits there with his fat, pudgy, bald-headed, um, you know, out-of-shape physique and counts the money and doesn't have to put it on the line himself and a various other number of things. But, uh, you know, that's that's at the base of it. But, you know, like I said one time, and, and it still holds true, and, and he didn't like that I said it, but a lot of other people that have dealt with him laughed at it. Paul Heyman would rather climb a tree and tell a lie than stand on the ground and tell the truth. And that's basically why I have heat with Paul and he has heat with me. Um, I'd like to know what you think about uh, them giving the titles to Ric Flair for the 15th time. Because um, you worked in old NWA time. and stuff. 18th okay. time. 19th time. 18th time. <laughs> well, whichever. Yeah, um, actually, um, you know, it's news to me, but thank God, uh, you know, maybe they had a moment of clarity and a sea of insanity. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that that happened. I haven't seen any WCW programming in, you know, since David Arquette became the champion, and I just decided, well... You know, it's time to fold the tent. Um, well, Jim, you didn't miss anything. I just had to tell you that. Uh, no, no, you know, Fla Fla Flair, Flair's title win over Jarrett was a good match, but but Flair's getting stripped of the title Monday, it looks like, so it didn't last long. And, so it was uh, going to be it. It's a seven-day deal. Question? Go ahead. Um, do you think that, you know how they said Shawn Michaels was a high flyer before the Iron Man match, and he had a good technical match? 
why don't why don't people think that with The Rock? I think he could have a good technical match, except for his figure four sucks. Um, I I was not aware that anybody thought that The Rock couldn't have a, a good technical match. Um, well, everybody just thinks he's rock bottom and eyebrow and everything like that. No, you know, The, the Rock is is a tremendous athlete. He's a great personality, and uh, he's young enough at his age. He is he's a phenomenal. He was a prodigy in this business as far as how quickly he learned. Uh, the basics, and then how quickly he got to uh, to be polished, and how quickly he learned psychology. And you got to remember, this guy's still in his twenties. The, the the great uh, wrestlers of this business usually all got that uh, that acclimation or whatever. I may be like Lex Luger and making up words here. When uh, when they were in their thirties, because it takes that long really for for guys to learn the ins and outs of this business. And so I think he's only going to get better. And I, I, I mean, I'm. I'm convinced that uh, that The Rock is his talent is going to live up to if it already doesn't his uh, his personality and his hype. Well, thanks for my questions, and I hope you do very well in OVW. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, uh, let's go to Ryan in Pennsylvania. You're next up. Hey guys, how you doing? Real good. Uh, Jim, I was wondering. Uh, the last caller said the heat between you and Paul Heyman, and now I was wondering. I know you appeared at ECW Arena a couple years ago. Who convinced you to appear then? Then uh, Chris Candido. Candido. Um, basically, Chris had called me and uh, and arranged. That's another uh, example of uh, Paul Heyman lying. Uh, uh, Chris had arranged that, and the the only reason I did it was because a I love Chris Candido to death, and b I had asked at that time for Paul Lee to shake hands with Dennis Corluzzo, who's a friend of mine, and uh, and bury the hatchet and try to work together. And of course, uh, he did that. He jumped in a limo that he provided for us and uh, shook hands with Dennis, where I was the only witness, and said, "All is forgiven, and we're going to work together." And I'm going to make the announcement to the boys, uh, you know, next week. And of course, that never happened. As soon as I was out of the building, you know, that was all forgotten. Um, once again, you know, I, I did it for just for the sheer fun of seeing Paulie have to shake hands with Dennis Corluzzo because I figured he was going to lie about it, but uh, and he did. But, um, you know, we had fun and, and did a little favor for Chris, and I got a little something out of it, and Dennis got a little something, and, you know, I was there, and then I left, and I haven't been back. And I was wondering, I wanted to get your opinion on uh, WCW releasing Bobby Eaton and how they did that. Um, actually, uh, it was typical WCW, and I... Um, I got a lot of things I would like to say, and uh, I could say more about it um, after, oh, say the next, uh, let's see, after the next uh, six weeks or so. That's when I'm going. I could say more about that because I figure after that they can't penalize Bobby in any way for anything that I might say. Hey Dave, I was want to get your thought. Is the Undertaker coming back at Judgment Day? I've been reading a lot on the net that he's going to be back. I believe so. If not, the next day. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm expe I'm expecting him back on Sunday. Yeah. I was wondering if are they going to keep Edge, Christian, and Kurt Angle together? Because I really think that they're going to be on the something there with those three being together as a group. Um, I don't know the answer if they are, but um, Christian and Edge cracked me up last night. You know, <laughs> we were just with the and then the last week or two. You know, the stuff, the kind of the new gimmick that they're doing. Yeah. I don't know if it's a great heat getting heel gimmick as much as just sort of something entertaining that people boo. But but I've been cracking up at it. Yeah. Um. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> oh, with the WCW, how come they're uh, getting rid of Ric Flair's title reign? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Well, there's, um, there's bound to be a great, uh, a great B-list comedian out there somewhere that needs a championship belt, so I'm sure they've got to move Flair out of the way for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, either either the, either this was a plan all along, or. Uh, or Flair, Flair's injured for a week, and so, you know, obviously you can't have your champion not defending the title for a week. It would kill your business, so, uh, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to be, you know, that's what they're saying on their website is they're going to strip him on Monday. That doesn't mean that they will. They may not, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's no such thing as a long-term champion there anyway. I mean, uh, let's see, they've... They, I, I can't even keep up with uh, how many titles they've, they've changed in the last five weeks. I think it's like six or something. It's, so almost, they had like six. it's almost pointless putting the belt on Jeff Jarrett because he loses it every two weeks. Jeff Jarrett is a many-time world champion, as Ric Flair correctly brought up on, on Monday's TV. <laughs> 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 everyone everyone is because they change the title every month, every Monday and, and some Wednesdays. I'm, I'm betting on Kimberly to be the next uh, WCW champion, actually, because uh, I figure... 
there's only one thing that, that takes priority over Russo's insistence that championships should be devalued at all costs, and that's his sexual frustration in wanting to have transvestites, cross-dressers, and uh, strippers with little clothes on bouncing around uh, in a wrestling match that they're not prepared for. So that puts Kimberly right in line for a championship reign. You think Russo put it all on the belt before he does that with Kimberly, though? Um, I, I, I think that Russo thinks if he was the WCW champion, it would probably devalue his importance because he would be a mere world champion instead of the power that bees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. <laughs> Is it WWE going to keep the push-up of Val Venus now? I guess he's, trying to, I guess he's kind of getting one now. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that they, you know, there's, there's so much TV time. And sometimes guys just kind of get, you know, kind of got forgotten just because other guys are getting pushed, and maybe this is their way of getting him back into the the mainstream. I don't think that they ever. I don't. I mean, I don't know, but I never heard anyone say anything particularly bad about him or that they had forgotten him. But uh, they, you know, for whatever reason, they hadn't done much with him in the last. I think uh, he was months. out. He was out with an injury for a while, and right, I think that right. Maybe he came, takes you out of out of the the circulation for a while, and then you get worked back in. And and they have so much talent now. I don't think they have to rush anything. What do you think of NWA Wildside? Um, actually, I've seen a, a couple of them, and of course, I was down um, to do uh, that television. Uh, uh, gosh, what was it? About a month ago. Uh, there's a lot of good talent down there. You know, a lot of young talent, inexperienced talent, as almost everyone is in this business these days that are not with the, you know, the big two, so to speak. Um, I think it's got some pluses and it's got some minuses. Um, you know, I'm not re really a fan. Um, of the you know the hardcore genre, although we are starting bulletin here an OVW hardcore championship, um, which is going to be done a little bit differently than than most of the uh, hardcore titles, and, and there's going to be nothing set on fire and no mouse traps. But uh, but I think there's a couple of real good kids down there, and uh, I also got an, uh, a chance to see a, a guy that I've been a fan of for a long time. He's uh, an independent wrestler from over in North Carolina, Timber the Lumberjack. He was down there at the uh, taping that I saw. And, uh, you know, I, I really think this kid is great. He just needs to find, you know, somebody to let his talent develop. Uh, also, there's a, a kid named A.J. Styles down in, in Wildside and, and uh, another young man named Onyx who, who uh, you know, is a, a good technician. So there's, there's a, a few guys down there that I think are really, really, uh, you know, they have a future. They have potential. Uh, real quick, I want you to mention uh, what you've got on the – on the show in June, the big one um, at the Louisville Gardens. It was like the 30th, what, 30th anniversary of wrestling in Louisville? Yes, as a matter of fact, for all of you uh, historians out there, it was June 1970 that Nick Goulas and Roy Welch opened up rest live professional wrestling in Louisville at the Louisville Gardens, which was known as the Convention Center then. And uh, there had been no live wrestling of any major uh, major league uh, affiliation since the early 60s. Uh, it was part of Dick the Bruiser's territory, the Indianapolis circuit back then. And uh, it had been kind of dormant, uh, so it was opened up in 1970. And this is the 30th anniversary of wrestling at the building in the Louisville Gardens. This kind of an interesting uh, trivia note has hosted more live professional wrestling cards uh, than any other arena in the country over the past 30 years. Really? And, uh, yes, because uh, when you when you take into consideration that they had weekly well, matches weekly. For, for 28 years straight, and then uh, the OVW events that have gone on over the past year or so, a uh, year and a half or so at the Gardens. Um, I, I mean, I would be glad to be challenged on that, but I did a little research and I can't come up with another one. Um, so what, we're gonna what, have a, what would you think would be would, would be second uh, Nashville Fairgrounds or? or? Um, no, because actually Nashville uh, wrestling over the past thirty years has has been in three or four different facilities there, and the okay. Mid South Coliseum uh, weekly matches uh, you know ceased in in uh, the mid nineties when they went to the to the Pipkin Building, and then uh, there's been matches at the Cook Convention Center and you know. Uh, Blah blah blah. So um, I think I think we've got it. And uh, anybody out there in the rest of the program who wants to challenge that, let me know. But at any rate, we're going to have a, a 30th anniversary uh, show. It's going to be all of the uh, OVW talents. We're going to bring some some of the legends in, including uh, the fabulous Jackie Fargo, who was, you know, in my mind, uh, but, you know, he and Lawler maybe neck and neck, but for the first uh, at least five years of Louisville wrestling and, and a lot in the 60s in Nashville and Memphis, etc. Jackie Fargo was God in this part of the country, the most popular wrestler that ever appeared here. And the one thing about it is, while everyone else has been both a heel and a babyface, Jackie Fargo was never a heel in this uh, territory after he established himself as, as the top guy. And he just, uh, you know, the most popular guy you can you can imagine in any wrestling territory. He was uh, uh, immense in Nashville and Memphis and Louisville. Uh, we're also going to have
Stan Lane and Steve Kern, the fabulous ones who were the most popular tag team in the history of Louisville. Dutch Mantel is going to be back. Um, and also we're going to have a, a lot of WWF talent, including uh, Mick Foley will be here for a, a Golden Circle ticket uh, holder's autograph session, and he'll be a special referee. Kane will be here, D'Lo Brown, Al Snow, uh, Mark Henry, Bull Buchanan, um, Kurt Angle, who uh, uh, that's a match that I'm dying to see. Kurt Angle, the 1996 Olympic gold medalist, as everyone knows, will face uh, the collector who uh, wrestles here in Ohio Valley Wrestling. He was a 1993 NCAA heavyweight wrestling champion, and the last time that Angle and the collector met was the 92 NCAA championships, and Angle won that one, and they've never had a rematch. But they will have that there on, here on June 23rd. And uh, it, it's going to be a tremendous night, ten matches, um, you know, a full lineup. We're going to have a, the hardcore title match between Trailer Park Trash and Flash. Uh, Al Snow, uh, as I said, will be here. And, and also, uh, you know, just a, a tremendous night all the way around. It's going to be history. It's going to be the present day. It's going to be the, the future with the OVW stars. And uh, one match, Dave, this is going to steal the show. Rico Constantino will team with uh, WQMF Radio's Charlie Steele. He's the afternoon drive time man on the number two rock station here in Louisville against Slick Robbie D and Tony Vanetti from the Fox, who is the number one uh, rock and roll DJ in town, and uh, I think that was going to steal the show because Vanetti and Steele are watching a lot of old Briscoe funk tapes. <laughs> All right. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I just watched from your show the tape of uh, uh, whatever the Waller Jackie Fargo tape that you put on about two three weeks ago. Yes. Oh, that was that. That was good. Well, we're, we're was, doing uh, we're doing weekly was... segments on the history of Louisville wrestling and going back and watching these tapes and some of the stuff from 16 millimeter film from the early 70s. You know, today's wrestlers need to see this stuff because they have forgotten just how how good that these guys were at, at not only at working the crowd but also at at, at timing and, and psychology and and I mean nobody can say and you saw that stuff that was from 1974. If you presented that in a ring today with two guys that were over the the people knew it would blow everything else on the card away because of its intensity and the heat involved and the passion. Um, the the nature and how they sold it really was something. It reminded me of um, of, of like some of the stuff in Japan. Yes. As far as like uh, you know, it was almost you know it was weird. Except that they were using they were using punches instead of kicks and chops. But it was it was very similar to like a really good like old UWFI style, believe it or not. I mean, you know, it was just it was all punches. It's exactly. All was, it, it, but it, it was it, believable looking. But but it was the way they sold it made it made it believable, I guess. Right, and and the the fact that the people were so into it, they lived and died with these guys, and whether they won or lost, and what they did, and what happened to them, and and the performance was so so good and so believable, and so it, it, with, without using the word stiff, it was you know these guys were going for it. The people. Believed Believe they were going for it. It was a fight, and uh, but but at, at the same time, timing and psychology came into it because everything was done at the right time to get the maximum amount of response, and that's uh, that's what we try to teach our our trainees down here is that it's not what you do, it's when you do it, and how good it looks when you do it. Yep. Let's go to Western Virginia. West, you're up with Jim Cornette. Hey guys, how's it going? Real good. Uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you, and Dave, you might know about the, the, the wrestler from the University of Minnesota, the heavyweight. Has he signed with either WCW or the WWF yet? Um, um, actually, Lesnar. Yeah, I was going to ask for, for Dave to call his name. I do not know. The only uh, uh, the last thing that I heard was in the Observer, as a matter of fact. I, I know that um, uh, Shelton, who is uh, from the University of Minnesota, Shelton Benjamin, one of our guys down here, um, obviously uh, you know is, is close with this guy, and hopefully that will make a difference because from what I've heard of him, he you know he has a lot of potential. Um, what I what, um, I know he had a meeting uh, last last week uh, with the WWF. And he has not signed with the WWF. I think it's come down to the WWF in New Japan with WCW as kind of like a major dark horse, like uh, very slim chances from what I gather. Um, Which end of the horse is WCW? <laughs> <laughs> so so um, that's that's kind of what I heard. I mean, he is training for pro wrestling right now with Brad Rangans. Um, and the people who have seen him say that athletically, I mean, his, his uh, speed at his size, because he's like 270-pound guy at 6'3", uh, is amazing. Um, there, they think athletically he's going to be able to pull it off. Personality-wise, he's you know it's it's quite a difference. I mean, he's not a natural at that. But then again, neither was Kurt Angle, and you know things happen. So right. um, you know, um, so I guess you know, but no, he hasn't signed with WWF yet. Okay. But 
Okay. Anything else, Wes? Yeah. Also, Jim, uh, what was the deal with Dennis Kundry after Star Kid '86? <laughs> I've always wanted to ask what you know, whatever happened to him. You know, he came back later with a uh, you know, Randy Rose. Um, that that like would be on? a separate program in itself. But I'll tell you the short <laughs> version. It wasn't really after Star Kid '86. It was in uh, March of '87. Dennis just basically disappeared. Uh, we didn't know he was gone. Me and Bobby didn't know he was gone. The promotion. Did. His wife didn't know he was leaving. Um, <laughs> and he he went away. And then he came back about. A year later, or a year and a half later, he resurfaced and was working with Randy Rose and, and Paulie Dangerously as the original Midnight Express, and they came in to uh, to uh, work for for Jim Crockett, and we uh, we had a, a feud ongoing. And when Crockett sold to PBS and new people, uh, you know, got to be involved. Um, they didn't like Randy Rose, and they were going to get rid of Randy Rose, but then somebody else knew came became involved. See, the pattern started even then. Uh, somebody else knew came, became involved and decided they liked Randy, but they didn't know about Dennis, and, and we were booked for a pay-per-view event, and Dennis just didn't show up. He decided, well, uh, they don't like me, and they may tell me to go, so I'm going to beat him to it. And he left, and nobody's ever seen him again. <laughs> That's right, and this one, Jack Victory was in the Night Express for one day, right? Exactly. Oh. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it was funny because Randy Rose was supposed to lose a Loser Leave Town match, and not Dennis, but Dennis was... The one who didn't come. Yeah, it was kind of you know an, an original thing in wrestling that the guy who was not supposed to leave left, and uh, <laughs> that's that's been it for Dennis as far as I know in wrestling. And and the last thing that we have, any of us have ever heard is that he lives in Colorado somewhere and he's out there. <laughs> I'll say, Dave, one last thing. I, I think I, I've, I've come up with the reason why Flair has to be stripped of the title. Okay. They're coming up, uh, you know, the old Crockett City, judging by the house show. You know, God forbid Flair, you know, be on top of anything. <laughs> you know, yeah, they might screw up and sell a ticket. Yeah, yeah. They love to kill the Crockett Cities. I mean, it, that's ridiculous. But uh, thanks for the comments, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go to Andy in Los Angeles. Andy, you're up with Jim. Hello, guys. Um, you know, what you were talking about earlier, Jim, uh, the psychology that was lost, you know, you're talking about the old tapes from the missed out era. I don't think you could do it even if you gave it to to uh, you know to Rock in Austin, and I'll tell you why. I think it's because kayfabe's gone. People, I mean, the wrestlers are open about it, so people are going into arenas today knowing, yeah, it's all fake, it's all book, it's all storyline. Whereas back then, I mean, fans don't believe it. I mean, you know, you hear all stories from the old heels about how they had to hide and be snuck out of arenas because fans wanted to kill them because they were so into what happened. I think yeah, I've, I've heard rumors of things like that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think you're exactly right, um, and that's you know part of the reason why I'm so horribly you know against this uh, new openness. But there's nothing you can do about it because if you've got a you know if you've got a thimble, you can't bail the ocean. So you just have to kind of ride the wave. But uh, that's one of the unfortunate things that was lost in this business when all of this you know became public. Uh, you know this would have killed uh, uh, magic shows. Uh, David Copperfield would be standing in the unemployment line now if, if so many things have been revealed about his business has been revealed about ours. Um, unfortunately, uh, in, you know, in this case, uh, while the the revenues, uh, the, the business has changed into something completely different, and revenue is, is great because what it changed into, a lot of people like, but for the performers, they don't get the satisfaction of, of having the emotion. Uh, they have the loud cheers, and they have the people, and they have the yelling, but they don't have the emotion that you could feel. And it um, you know, I could literally feel uh, in those days people wanting to kill us, you know, and you could literally feel when, when – uh, the Rock and Roll Express or Dusty Rhodes or, or any of the top baby faces would get in the ring. You could feel that they just loved them and lived with everything they did. You don't have that anymore, and it's, it's sad that a lot of the guys these days in the business that really love the business didn't get a chance to experience a feeling like that. Yeah, but if they do get it, it's very short-lived, like that Dallas Raw where uh, the Radicals got in the ring for that 10-man match. That audience was incredible, but I don't think you're going to get an audience reaction to those four guys again at this point. No, I, I, that brings up something because a lot of people have brought up the fact that this 60-minute match on Sunday is in Louisville as a reason why it may do better than if it had been in, say, New York or Los Angeles. And I think you being in Louisville, what, what is your thoughts about it being in Louisville as opposed to New York and L.A. trying to go 60 minutes? Um, I think that if they're going to have a tremendous advantage. Um, if it was New York or Los Angeles, I think their gooses would be cooked if they brought chainsaws into the ring and tried to go an hour. Um, I think that it would be better if it was in an Atlanta or a Charlotte or, a, or one of the cities in Florida because even Louisville was not, was not part of the, the – 
uh, how can I say this, uh, the Louisville style, the old style in the Tennessee and Kentucky territory wasn't the 60-minute draw. It wasn't the NWA world title match coming in and, and going 60 minutes. That was the Carolinas. That was Georgia. That was Florida. So those fans from years ago would have seen more of them than they saw in this part of the country. But the advantage here is that, A, they're still wrestling fans here. Uh, they love a good match regardless of how long it goes. B, uh, the WWF is so hot in this town. Not only is, uh, for example, there's 19, 20,000 seats in Freedom Hall. They sold out an hour and ten minutes when tickets went on sale. And there's a SmackDown here coming in September that already Freedom Hall is halfway sold out for that before the pay-per-view even happened. And uh, we have a, a tremendous advance for our June show. Our June show, the advance uh, from over a month out, is already double any uh, house that OVW has drawn at the Louisville Gardens. And then, uh, you know, just the, the publicity. I mean, uh, the, the pay-per-view is the hottest ticket I've ever seen. We have people calling the radio stations. We have people talking to us at our matches. How can I get a ticket? Good God, just get me in the building. So I think the people are going to be so jacked and so ready for this thing. Um, you can't go anywhere in this town without hearing The Rock say, do you smell what The Rock is cooking on every radio station? And, and you know, uh, it, TV stations are doing wrestling specials. So the people are going to be jacked, and they're going to be ready for this show, and I think that's going to give them a tremendous advantage. Well, Jim, I'm sorry to hear you say that uh, no more WWF for you because, you know, it's nothing like watching XPW to make me appreciate the really good talent that's out there. <laughs> oh, have you seen that program? Oh, it's, I'm in L.A., so, yeah, unfortunately I have. Good God Almighty. I, you know, my uh, a birthday present for anybody out there that knows where the, the uh, transmitter is for whatever satellite network they're on, hmm. a birthday present for me would be blow the son of a gun up <laughs> so I don't have to look at that stuff. They're on this little independent low-power station here in town. And my God, it's a it's 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 a high school ripoff of ECW. And now, when I say something's a ripoff of ECW, that means lesser than ECW. To me, means lesser than zero. Um, it's horrible. There are so many bad wrestling programs on the air these days that it it, it astonishes me uh, that they can somehow get an audience somewhere. I have to think that maybe just whatever building they're running in happens to be air conditioned in a heat wave. Well, Jim, you got to watch the very opening of the show. You get the disclaimer that they always run for infomercials you know the pro following uh paid pro paid uh show is we make no claims about the f whatever you know you know like when they run a typo informa infomercial for half an hour that same disclaimer that runs in the beginning that runs out here which means that they're basically buying one whole block of the show to put themselves on the air they're only advertisers of themselves yeah, there, there, there's a couple of wrestling programs out there right now on television that I think they would do wonderful business and get a lot of calls and a lot of response if they gave away free blindfolds, you know, with uh, proof of viewing. Um, you know, it's it's but you know, with with as hot as wrestling is, you got to expect that people are going to jump on trying to make a buck off of it. That that uh, you know, basically are going to put on a product that is, you know, somewhere in the near area of rotten. So, you seen it yet? I, I I only saw the first home video. Um, I have not seen like any of their TV shows. Oh, I'm supposed to get a tape fairly soon. But um, you know, I mean, you got to remember that these are guys who who wanted to be part of uh, ECW, and you know, Paul Heyman I guess didn't want a business partner, so they decided that they could create their own ECW. And for better or for worse, about Paul Heyman, the one thing we can all say is. You know, he has 25 years of studying the wrestling industry, and he's, he's pretty damn smart. And when you have guys who, who watch, who think, who, you know, watch two years of Paul Heyman and think, aha, now we know wrestling, it's kind of scary what, what, what the result oh, yeah. might be. And, and, you know, i got, I got to say something. I've never said that Paulie wasn't smart. He's, he's very smart. As a matter of fact, sometimes he's too smart for, for his and everybody else's own good. But, you know, he's a, he's a smart guy, and, and he, he knows how to put on a television program, whereas a lot of these guys just come up out of the, you know, the woodwork somewhere, and uh, it's, it's really it's embarrassing to the industry, but it's a free country, unfortunately, and what can you do? Uh, but I would invite everybody that, that cares anything about the business to try to not watch these things just because it will turn you off to wrestling quickly. If, if I saw this program, I would have never become a wrestling fan. The, the, com the commentators are both terrible. The play-by-play the, the -play guy screams his damn head off, and the color guy is this older Mexican guy who actually knows what he's talking about in places, but he's, his accent is so bad he makes Eddie Guerrero sound well, like that's, Pat. It's a gimmick that's, that's my friend Pat. That, I think that's my... Is it like, something like just Victor Rivera gimmick? Uh, I don't know who Victor, Victor Rivera is, but he's... Oh, Victor Rivera was a big star in the 70s. I think the guy who does that is, is a friend of mine from way, way back 
I mean, he knows wrestling uh, named Pat Howard, but I think he does like a Victor Rivera gimmick. Yeah, it's, it's a gimmick accent through and through. Oh, nobody yeah. talks like that, really. Sounds like Cheech Marin. Yeah, I mean... Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia, brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly via email to Dave Meltzer at yada.com will win a poster of a WF Superstar, courtesy of RC Edge. Remember to include your mailing address with your answer. Here's today's question. What was Owen Hart's very first ring name in the World Wrestling Federation? And I just want to tell everyone right now, it was not the Blue Blazer. So anyway, um, that's, uh, like that's the big question. And uh, anyway... We'll get to that later on. I think I think that one's pretty difficult. We, we either have ones that people get in like one minute or ones that people don't get at all. I think this one's going to be one on the tougher side. We've got another question later for the show for a Logitech Quick Cam I want to mention also. And this is one that, Jimmy, you cannot blurt out the answer because I know you know you know. Well, the I was about question. to say, am I eligible on any of these things? You're not eligible for well, either I, of them. And the next I can't one, email I you anyway. Not. I don't have a computer, so. Okay, the next one you're really not eligible for. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We, we've got a full bank of calls. We've got a ton of emails. Um, and usually that's not the case on Fridays. But, anyway, but it is today. Uh, anyway, this is from Tommy Noe. I know that the phone line just jammed because he had to email. He could not get through. So anyway, it goes, are you going to be working for Rob, Ron Fuller in Knoxville on Friday nights? WBIR TV 10 had a story featuring Mark Henry promoting wrestling at Chilhowee Park. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Ron Fuller, who is a uh, legendary name in professional wrestling, for those of you who don't know, he's, uh, uh, was not only a great wrestler himself, but also the promoter for Southeastern Championship Wrestling in Knoxville for years, brother of Robert Fuller. People may know him as Colonel Parker and from WCW. He's a member of a famous wrestling family that, that just dominated wrestling in the South for like 50 years from the 30s to the 80s. Um, Ron will be running every Friday night at Chilhowee Park, uh, where they used to run years ago in Knoxville outdoors, um, through the summer, starting May 26th, that's the first Friday night, going through Labor Day, and uh, I will be down there for at least the first uh, few shows, along with uh, some of the Ohio Valley Wrestling Stars will be uh, appearing on the cards there as well, and uh, you know, we're hoping to do real well, of course I love Knoxville to death, and, and I will be there definitely on Friday night, May 26th, as will um, uh, you know, a number of the OVW guys, and over the summer they'll get to see uh, Rico Constantino and Slick Robbie D, and the Damage, uh, Nick Dinsmore, and Mark Henry, and, and a host of others from OBW down there on Friday nights. Well, you also got invited to dinner when, you come, when you're in Knoxville, so that's awesome. Uh, oh, nice. excellent. And I'll tell you what, his mother is a tremendous cook, is Tommy Noe's mother. I'll say that right now. I think I knew that. I think I've heard that story before. This is uh, this is a question that goes. Uh, what did uh, this is? Uh, this intrigues me, being that I was actually at this show and I have no idea what this is about. So, guess, what did you think of the incident that took place in the main event of Starcade 1986 between Ric Flair and Nikita Koloff? I just remember them having a pretty good wrestling match. Um. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know what incident that, and I was there. Um, I don't remember an incident either. I was there, too. And also, were you angry when uh, Boss Man didn't catch you and you broke your leg? Actually, <laughs> you know, right? Actually I didn't break my, ne my leg. I wish I had of it. It would have been easier because that would have healed. I tore my anterior cruciate ligament, uh, screwed up the cartilage, chipped the meniscus, the whole nine yards. Uh, no, I wasn't. After I watched the tape, you know, the uh, University of Alabama <laughs> football team fast. could have caught me. You fell too fast. Yeah, you know, and, and the sun got in his eyes, and, and uh, Bubba was never a pitcher, or uh, never a, a catcher, uh, never a good baseball player, I'll say that for him. Uh, no, it just he was kind of going to break my fall, and he didn't, but, uh, you know, I might have killed him when I landed, so. Uh, let's, let's go to uh, James in Seattle. James, you're next up with Jim Cornette. Hey, guys, how's it going? It's going really good. <laughs> hey, um, Jim. Did, is it true that you used to uh, run the Bob Armstrong fan club back in the early 70s? As a matter of fact, God, that's a good trivia question. Yes. Um, you did? I didn't even know that. I thought I knew everything about yes, you. because what happened was um, I basically belonged to every fan club that I could find for every wrestler that I could find, every subscribed to every newsletter, every fan bulletin, etc., and... I was a frustrated writer, of course. Later on, I got to do you know wrestling magazines and things like that. But when I was like 13 or whatever, um, the guy that ran that uh, had to give it up due to other commitments or whatever and asked me if I wanted to take it over, and I did for about a year and a half. And uh, it was fun doing the bulletins. And, of course, then 
uh, due to my nature of excess, I've started doing these, you know, 20 page legal sized bulletins with news from every wrestling office in America and, uh, a combination of, uh, the, the dues would have been phenomenal to actually pay for what I was producing. And, uh, when I got more involved in photography in, you know, in the wrestling business here, I had to give it up. But, uh, it was fun because I got to do a bulletin and, you know, uh, be my, you know, my frustrated, uh, journalist side came to the front. Did, by the way, did, did you hear about Jumbo Saruta? Did I what now? Did you did you hear about Jumbo Saruta? I'm just wondering. No, no, I did not. He he passed away Saturday. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I did. Yeah. I know. I had no idea what happened. Um, he was undergoing. Um, it was in. A, he was in the Philippines. I guess one of the things was he was trying to stay out of the United States or Japan because he, I guess, didn't want to call attention to the fact that he had cancer. Oh. And he, oh, he was in he was in Japan at a um, at a cancer hospital. Uh, until April, and I guess he got worse, and so he went to Australia to partially stay out of the limelight, and also uh, to wait for a donor because I guess it's very difficult. He needed he needed a new kidney, oh. and um, so he's waiting for a donor, and a donor showed up in the Philippines. He went to the Philippines, had the surgery Saturday, and um, bled to death after the operation. Oh my! Well, now how could you bleed to death after an operation in a hospital? I don't know. It's the Philippines. I, the only th as soon as I heard that story, I, I I don't know if you saw the Andy Kaufman movie, but I thought of Andy Kaufman going to the Philippines for his cancer. Yeah, I, I sure did. Well, I did. I did not know that, and I, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Uh, James, anything else? Uh, James is off. Okay, we're gonna. We've go lost him. Hal is the, is okay. the caller there? We're gonna go to Chris in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Hi guys, how are you? Really um, good. I'm just calling. Actually, um, I have two things to um, ask you guys. Uh, I just had some names of some wrestlers. I was just wondering what they're up to, if if you know it all. Um, we, can, we can try. Uh, Blackjack Mulligan. That's a good question. I don't know what's up with Blackjack Mulligan. I do not know. The last I heard, he lived down in Florida, and haven't heard uh, too much about him in the past several years. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. Okay, Bob Bob Orton. Bob Orton's living in St. Louis, and and his son's going to be working for Jim. Right, yeah, Bob is, is still lives in the St. Louis area, and uh, of course he hasn't wrestled in the past couple of years. But uh, his son, who uh, you know is a tremendous prospect, will will be starting with us shortly. All right, and um, how about um, Hill Billy Jim? Does he work for WWF? Hill Billy Jim, uh, as a matter of fact, lives outside of Bowling Green, Kentucky, where he has lived for years and years, and uh, he still, uh, to my knowledge, does a lot of uh, PR uh, for the. Uh, 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 WWF home videos. Uh, at least uh, as of you know a year, year and a half or so ago, he was doing that. Oh, okay. And uh, Dave, I just had a question um, or something to suggest for a poll. I'm not sure how you feel about it though, but uh, for sure. both uh, or actually all three ECW. Believe, believe me, I need poll questions. Okay. <laughs> WCW and uh, the WWF. Uh, maybe if you list a few wrestlers, um, who do you dislike seeing the most in the ring or on TV? And uh, I'm just wondering if you do the WWF, can you put the Godfather and uh, X Pac there? No, oh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know that a lot of. Uh, well, I don't know what people would think about that. I, I think X Pac's pretty popular with a lot of people, and you know, Godfather's the Godfather. What can I say? <laughs> I mean, he's not there because he's a talented wrestler, but he's there because he gets the big pop walk and you know, at the beginning of his match. Yeah, about it. Okay, then that's it. Okay. Let's go to uh, Dominic in Virginia. Dominic, what's going on? David, Jim Coronet. Shame you weren't on last week, but still. Um, kind of oh, like believe me, I, I would have rather been on last week than what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, pretty much I give these to almost all the legends who end up showing up here. Um, legends. That's a scary word, huh, Jim? I think of Jim as a legend. I remember... I mean, I mean, we, we got, like, Harley Race and Gene Kaniski coming up. I would consider them legends. Jim's just some guy that, that was a really good guy. Yeah, and, and I'm hoping that I've got, uh, you know, at least a few more years of life before I enter that, uh, you know, geez, I'll, I'll be 39 this year, you know. Okay. And they thought you were much older, but that's oh, don't say that. <laughs> so does everybody else. All I, remember, you know, you... Remember, all I remember was seeing you like in God when you guys were starting up in Mid South, starting with the Rock and Roll Express. I well, remember that from years ago. I think I'm the youngest three decade star in wrestling. <laughs> um, just want to ask you this: um, through your years of like all pretty much, I'm you've pretty much seen all done all and all that. But who have you felt that has not really gotten? Pretty much their due respect, like the push because of, you know, other things. I remember, like, Terry Funk was talking about, like, Eddie Gilbert. Um, Lance Russell mentioned, like, Buddy Landell, but someone who really never got to the higher plateau who you thought should have. And also the role reversal. Who do you feel 
that got, you know, superstar push and didn't deserve it. Not Sable. Oh, Sable. God. Well, Sable. <laughs> well, you know, actually limiting it to wrestlers, I mean, Sable is the ultimate, ultimate example of someone who had no knowledge, no uh, talent, no uh, preparation, no uh, effort put into her chosen profession and made a fortune. So that, you know, but, but limiting it to wrestlers, which, you know, uh, well, Sable even tried to wrestle. My God, Sable's just, you know, a disgusting blemish on the wrestling landscape. But I would have to say, without doubt, there's only one wrestler that could ever be picked and chosen as the person who should not have, could not have, but did, and that's the Ultimate Warrior. I, was I think say he can go too. no further. I was going to say that one too. Yeah, if I mean, Tony, I mean, this, if, if Tony this, Norris would have lasted longer in his spot, I would have said him. But he really didn't have his long. You know, he pretty much faded into where he is now, which is kind of nowhere. Yeah, you know, but uh, I mean, there's there's an Ahmed Johnson that comes along every five years, or maybe even more often. That you know, there there's bad wrestlers that that come and get over and go. But the Ultimate Warrior, just that this guy was ever employed in the wrestling industry with his lack of talent, lack of preparation, lack of uh, uh, effort into learning his chosen profession, and just overall disregard for the safety of the people that he wrestled and worked with and, and just overall disregard for the entire professional wrestling business as a whole. I would have to, and, and, and when you weigh that against the tremendous name that he got and the tremendous money that he was paid to do it, I th you know, he, he gets the all-century award. Um, as far as a guy who who didn't make it that should have, I mean, I mean, my God, that boggles the mind. You could literally go uh, through stacks of programs or newspaper clippings of the past two decades, and, and you could pick out name after name of, of guys who, if they'd been in the right place at the right time and gotten the right break, they really could have, you know, could have gone somewhere. And, and the, the ones that you mentioned are, you know, are great examples. Uh, you know, and, and of course, I mean, a, a guy who's everybody's heard of but who never really got the brass ring, Brad Armstrong. Oh, God damn. You know, um, uh, I mean, just a tremendous talent, tremendous person, tremendous personality, tremendous physique, uh, the whole nine yards. Never really got anybody, n nobody ever got behind him and lifted him up and pushed him to the spot before he had been seen so long as a mid-card guy that that's what he was labeled forevermore. But, uh, I mean, the whole Armstrong family, you can't find a more talented family anywhere in this business, but, uh, um, you know, he, he's a guy, and I mean, you could go back to the 70s and talk about Chris Colt, uh, who was just a phenomenal wrestler that nobody ever saw, and, you know, there's so many you can't really pick, but usually in, in this business, because of the, the number of people involved in the the area of uh, you know involved you can't pick one person but boy warrior is right there warrior's there he's the standout all right no problem all right gentlemen have a good night now thank you okay we coming up we're going to give away a webcam not just any webcam it's the logitech quick cam express a plug and play camera that's a breeze to install and use for videos and photos that you can email to friends and family just as easily as you send text web pages with streaming video just like you see here at iata and live video hookups you can buy the logitech quick cam express for under fifty dollars check out quickcam.com but you can win one right here and right now the first person who calls up and can answer this question that uh, jim cornett knows the answer to so you better be quiet what was, who were the participants in the first ever scaffold match? And he wasn't in it. I just want you to know that, so don't call up about that one, because that's the first famous one, but it was not the first one. So anyway, um, it's, this is a tough question. So anyway, if you call up, uh, you can get to it. And, I, th I uh, think I know where you got that uh, trivia question from, but I'll remain silent. Um, well, that's what jar I actually knew it, but it did jar my memory. And and considering you were on and I had to come up with a question, I thought it was sort of apropos. There yes. you go. But we, we, we better hurry because the guy with the vibrating joystick is coming up soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I also want to mention next week, uh, Monday we're going to have Sheldon Goldberg on. Tuesday we're going to have John Muse. Wednesday we have an, we're going to have a taped show, and I believe, Al, is that right? We're going to have the Bad News Allen repeat from yesterday on Wednesday? Yeah, because I, I just want to let if you did not hear the show, we probably had more compliments on that show yesterday with Bad News Allen than any show since, maybe since when we had Bret Hart on the last time, or maybe even more, but uh, uh, that was a really, because we had, Bad News Allen was a really good guest. If you ever do a radio show, you got to call him up, Jim. Very good. I'd, yeah, uh, I mean. What was his uh, main topic of conversation? There really was no topic. He just, you know, we talked about, you know, a little bit about the judo when he was in Japan and talking about the different territories, WWE, just very open about everything. You know, who he liked, who he didn't like. You know, kind of like the Dynamite Kid book. It's like it's all out there. He, he, yeah. He, he wasn't protecting anybody. You know what I mean? <laughs> sort of like when he wrestled. 
<laughs> Guys, I apologize for interrupting. Dave, we have Jason from Nashville is going to take a guess. Okay, Jason from Nashville, you're first up for the trivia question. Uh, Coco Ware versus Bill Dundee. You know, that's really, really close, but it's not the right answer. All right. That, that actually would have been... Um, He's about 10 years off. Next, yeah. next, <laughs> next up is Harry from Las Vegas. Harry from Las Vegas. Oh, Harry's pretty smart. He may get this one. Harry, what is it? I'm pretty smart, but the other guy took my guess. Oh, man. <laughs> I, am, I haven't been having a good week. Uh, oh, well. Okay, thanks, dude. All right. All right, let's. Right. Anybody else there? Uh, let's go to... Uh, anyway. Hold up, hold up, hold up. we got Adam from Brooklyn who's going to take a guess. Adam from Brooklyn, go ahead. Oh, hi. I, was, I think it's um, the Road Warriors and the Rock and Roll Express. No. Actually, they never even had one. That's right, because Midnight Express had them against both those teams, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that and actually, if you if you want to know more uh, history without giving away the the answer, uh, Bill Dundee and Coco Ware was not even the first scaffold match that Bill Dundee had. The first scaffold match that Bill Dundee ever had was against Jerry Brown, who was of the Hollywood Blondes. I did not. Now that and I didn't know. That took place in a couple of different cities in this territory uh, about uh, four or five years before the Bill Dundee Coco Ware match. Wow, that one I didn't know. Okay, Dave, we've got one more on the line. It's Doug from Florida. Doug from Florida, go ahead. Hi, right, listen. Uh, wouldn't it have been the Road Warriors and the um, God, the Rock and Roll Express? God, what? They, they, they never wrestled <laughs> each other. Come on, don't do this to me. <laughs> they just asked that. The Road Warriors, the Road Warriors and the Midnight Express was the famous one at the Night of the Skywalkers at Starcade. What is eighty-seven? Right? Eighty-six. Eighty-six. Okay. And we were That's with right. Rock and Roll in eighty-seven. Right, because I was I was at that one when you fell off that scaffold, but that was not the first. And the Coco Ware uh, Dundee match was in uh, what about an 82-ish? 82. -ish? 82. Right? Okay, good. Dave, we've got right. one more. Uh, Gary from Nashville. Gary from Nashville, go ahead. Okay, it was Jerry Jarrett and Ellen Green. Oh boy, what, what was not... that again? I couldn't say, hear say, it. Say, say it again. Jerry Jarrett and Ellen Green. See, incorrect. Jerry Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett and Ellen Green. That is incorrect. Oh, he's going to be really mad. Oh, he's going to be hot. He's going to be mad, man. That one. I think I got oh, another boy. one coming in. Hang on a second, guys. Okay. Who is it? Can I throw a question in before we get It's our buddy Mark from Connecticut. Mark, um, hey, I swear to God, Jim, Mark is really smart. Good. Uh, this is a tough one. Um, and I don't even, I just got on, I don't know if this was said. Uh, 82, Coco Ware and Norvell Austin? No. No. You don't got it either. Man. Uh, I told you it was tough. Next time for sure, Dave, next time. Man, I'm glad no one's calling from, from a certain city. Yeah, or, or I'll tell you, if you get another caller from Nashville, you know, they might be closer, but... Uh... Yeah. It's, it's, by the way, just so just so that doesn't throw anyone off, it was not in Nashville. Uh, anyone, else, anyone else there, or should I just start going with nope. some questions? Uh, why don't we, why don't we uh, give that one more time, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to the other callers that we have on the line. Okay, guys, um, it's just, just real quick. It's um, who was the participants in the first ever scaffold match? Uh, and you can get a Logitech Quick Cam uh, um, if you if you, if you uh, call it. But you got to call it. It's not an email question. Because of the difficulty of the question, do you want to give the date? 1973. No. Okay. 1971. 1971. Okay, there you go. Okay, uh, let's go to Craig in Ontario. Craig, what's going on? Hello. Hello, James. Hello. Hello, Dave. Hi, how are you? I have three questions for you, Jim. Uh, what was your favorite tag team to manage? Um, you know, I've been asked this a million times, and it's like picking your favorite kid. Um, and, of course, the Midnight Express, uh, both incarnations because of the success and the fun we had and et cetera. You know, w w I can't pick between Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, although for sentimental reasons, you know, Bobby and Stan, we were together longer and, you know, had a lot more fun. Um, you know, and also the heavenly bodies. Uh, you know, you can't forget uh, Tom Pritchard and Stan Lane and then Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey. Uh, you know, I, I hate to pick, but obviously the most successful version in, in, in the ring was Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry, the most successful version for uh, publicity and, and all around having a ball together was Bobby and Stan. Uh, your favorite singles wrestler? Um, you know, I, I managed Dick Murdoch, who I loved to death for a little while. I managed uh, uh, Bubba Rogers, the big boss man, for quite a while and really enjoyed that. Uh, you know, it, 
it's, it's really hard to pick, uh, you know, the favorite guy you managed because, you know, there was a lot of fun and a lot of, uh, a lot of big moments involved with most of them. The thing that I love the most about you, do you still have the tennis racket? Oh, yeah, a number of them, as a matter of fact. Okay, good. As long as you don't lose that. Don't worry. As long as there's a Walmart around, I can always have a tennis racket. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Al, any more callers as far as the question? Yeah, Jason from Nashville is going to try again. Okay, Jason, go ahead. Uh, I'll try uh, Jerry Jarrett against Jackie Fargo. No. No? All right, thanks. No. Anybody else? Oh, 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 oh. That one hurt. That one hurt. Move on to to Mark here. Okay, Mark in Florida, you're next up. Gentlemen, how are you tonight? First of all, am I eligible to win the prize? Yes, you are. It's uh, it's Jerry Jarrett and Don Green. Bingo! Oh, you're so smart. You got it. Bingo. You got it. Hey, you Kim, got what, it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim, can't let this go as a Texas boy, even though I'm calling from Florida. I can't let uh, something you said earlier go without a challenge. The Dallas Fortatorium, I think, probably had a much longer streak than Louisville. But now, remember my qualifier over the last 30 years. From, from 1970 on? From 1970 to 2000. But as far as running weekly shows, the Sportatorium was running between Gray Pearson and Jim Crockett and Bob Meister and then a couple of guys that ran after well into 98. Uh, but how long has it been since there's been a show at the Sportatorium? But ha- but how far did Louisville go torn- back? It was torn down. Well, we started 70, and that's when Louisville started with 70. All right. It's, it's, it, it would be close, though, if you actually looked at numbers. And Mark, you know what, by the way, way I, know, I know which Mark this is. And one of my okay, favorite you know marks. You know what? Okay, okay, you know what? I just thought about something. It might be it might be real close, and it might even be the Sportatorium, because the Sportatorium sometimes had run twice a week. Right, Mark? Yeah. Like when they, they were doing TV tapings. They would run, they, not only would they run, they would run televisions on uh, Saturday, Friday night and Saturday. Right. Ooh, so, now that's so, a very good point. That's a good point. I just remembered the Saturday morning TV tapings at the Sportatorium that they did for many years. That's a very good point. But now then we have to go back and pick nits and say we said major arena. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you read the After Magazine, the Sportatorium was a major arena. <laughs> but did the Harlem Globetrotters or Elvis Presley or Earth, Wind, and Fire ever play the Sportatorium? <laughs> yes, Elvis Presley did play the Sportatorium. Elvis Presley did play the Sportatorium. I know that, too. That's right. Go ahead. Son of a gun, come to think of it, you're right about that too. Okay, I defer to Mark Nolte, and I will, uh, I will forevermore be impressed by your uh, encyclopedic knowledge, my friend. I don't know if that, I don't know if that's go a on, good thing or a bad thing. You got to go on TV. You got to go on TV next Wednesday and go. The Louisville Gardens, one of the two major <laughs> <laughs> that has held the most wrestling cards in the last thirty and, years. And I tell you what, I will even go but further. The only I will. One, but the only one that's still standing. <laughs> I, will, I will qualify it next week by saying the Louisville Gardens, the only or the, has hosted more professional wrestling matches over the last 30 years than any major arena in the country made out of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> that's not made out of aluminum siding. Yeah. <laughs> is there air conditioning in the Louisville Gardens? There absolutely is. It's I would point good, that out. <laughs> the air will be cool, but the ring will be hot at the Gardens on June 23rd. Mark, Mark, Mark before you leave, don't forget to leave your address with the with the uh, with the producer, okay? I sure will. Quick Okay, you can, go, you can go ahead. We're not trying to run you off or anything. Oh, okay. Hey, by the way, speaking of Ahmed Johnson, I know how bad Ahmed looked in uh, the WWF, and I know how bad he looks now. In w- in, he looks like Rosie O'Donnell you know, on steroids in WCW now. But uh, there was a time in the mid early 90s when he, or the mid-90s when he was first breaking in. You have never seen such a phenomenal athlete in your life, which goes back to this guy was 311 pounds. He could jump flat-footed from the floor to the apron. You know that that thing that Snooker used to do? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, no, yeah. no doubt about it. Ahmed was a tremendous athlete, wrestler, and eh, let's go back to Tom McGee for the great athlete, great wrestler contradiction. Oh, but, it, but again, it just points out how important attitude is. Oh, yeah. As soon as, soon as Tony Norris got some recognition, I've never seen a head get inflated so quickly and it ruined him. As soon as he signed with the WWF, he thought he was the biggest superstar in history, and, and he just quit progressing and quit caring. At that point, he thought everybody would owe him everything. The, the word inflated generally is, is attached to most bad talents in this business, whether they be the inflated Sable kind or the inflated Ahmed Johnson kind. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but, uh, yeah. Dom, I, I know you got a, a bank full of calls. It's always good talking to you guys, and uh, thank, thanks for the shot at the webcam. Okay, great. Thanks a bunch, Mark. Um, before we before we get to the uh, before we get to the callers, I want to get to this real quick. There's one email here that I wanted to get your take on. It's from Todd Clayton, who says, "How do you think the past 15 years in wrestling would have been different or not different if Terry Allen had not had that uh, car accident?" Oh, um, I, I don't think truthfully that uh, the past 15 years would have been much different. I think the the Three or four years uh, or five years following uh, his accident would have been much different in terms of the NWA influence. Uh, Magnum would have been a tremendous talent and a top dog in the NWA, and then it would have been bought by WCW. And I would think that um, the, the general progression of the business would have been the same, but I think that maybe you would be seeing uh, Magnum TA lowered from the ceiling instead of Sting. Or, or, or something of that nature, but just because of the fact that Magnum would have been in one of those spots, uh, those Luger Sting spots, and, and would have been absorbed by WCW and TBS and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he probably would have been in the, good chance he would have been in the Sting spot. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're, they're actually the same age, even though people think of would think of Magnum as being much older. They're actually, him and Sting are the exact same age. Yeah, Magnum made a tremendous name for himself, but when you think about it, as far as being pushed in a top spot in this business, it was a three-year run uh, from 84 in Mid-South to 86 in the NWA. Let's go to Jim in Nebraska. Jim, what's going on? Yes, how you doing? First of all, thank you for having Mr. Cornett on. He's long been one of my favorite brains in the business. Well, thank you. And we're both from Kentucky originally, or I'm from originally from Kentucky. I have what part? I am uh, too. Jamestown. Okay, I'm I'm from Louisville originally. Oh yeah, I was the first voice of the old ICW with Randy and all. My God, really? And your yes. your name again? Jim Helm. I remember you. I watched you. Yeah, a little little ugly short guy. Yes. At any rate, I, I, want, <laughs> I want a shot at the scaffold deal. Oh I, man, you're too late. The last guy just got it. Okay, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. But but go ahead. Did you have it right or not? Well, no, I had Irish Mike Clancy. And Frank Tarzan Hewitt with uh, with Nick Lewis's promotion. If that's true, we're in trouble. <laughs> Boy, they didn't call it exactly that. I think they called it. Oh, a and we're okay. Match. I you called it a what? what? A carpenter's match. Wow. But it was on it was on a, on a scaffold. Well, that would have been that would be news to me and probably everybody else living. <laughs> wow. My yeah, that was in the weird. that was in the late fifties. Wow. Good night. Well, we. We we may need documentation on that one, or you may have to give out two prizes. <laughs> well, I, I was just I was just a, a, a pretty young man myself. I was I'm 54 now. At any rate, uh, uh, this is directed toward Mr. Cornett, uh, and, and like I said, I, I love some of the gimmicks. I, I I used to book some myself, and may again one of these days. But uh, is he the one that did the uh, Mr. Cornett? Did you originate the baby bottle gimmick? Oh Lord, no! No, uh, really that was yeah. um, that has been done many times, many times over the course of history. I think it's probably been lost to the sands of time as to who did it first, but it was done before I was born. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I I think I was you were the first one I ever seen doing it. So, and I, I uh, how about losing midget wears a dress? Did you do that one? Uh, no, I have worn dresses uh, many times, as a matter of fact, in my private life, but several times, no, but several times in public in the oh, so course of a stipulation. But uh, now I don't know about the midget twist. Uh, yeah. You know, that's an interesting one. Wow. But um, it, it's, it's just documentation that everything conceivable has been done in wrestling, and if you study history, that's a good place. Because, you know, if you steal from one place, it's plagiarism. If you steal from two places, it's research. Isn't that the truth? No, no, no. Didn't Paul Bosch originate the ring, the ring it with fish gimmick? Um, I think Houston went through a phase in the '40s where they did a number of things in '50s. Uh, the you know the loser washes the donkey and the, the right, you know ring filled with mud or jello or or snow or uh, fish or what have you because it was a, you know fishing area as well down there. I think it was in Galveston. Um, but you know that Houston in the late '40s, early '50s, uh, you know they did some strange things, and and uh, as a matter of fact, I'm I'm hesitant to say a lot of them out loud for fear that they'll be repeated on you know next week's Monday Night Telecast. <laughs> <laughs> My last question, sir, is why didn't Rip Rogers go further than he did? Um, Rip has worked for every major promotion in the last 20 years, and every 
part of this country in Canada, and um, we, he's our local legend here, and, and basically it's because he, he never liked to suck up, never liked to kiss ass, and never liked to be politically correct, because Rip's a different kind of individual, and he just rubs a lot of people the wrong way, <laughs> and so that is, uh, that's attributable to why he never really got featured a lot of places, because they were scared of the son of a guy. Because he had hellacious talent. Oh, tremendous, yeah, tremendous yeah. talent, tremendous athlete. The last time I saw Rip Rogers, he was sleeping. They've come in from a road trip. You know T and Dale Man T and T. Oh yeah. Okay, old Dale Man deal. Uh, he was sleeping in a bin, I believe, in an old garage, waiting to go on the next trip. But uh, at any rate, uh, I, I, again, I um, I plan on get back to Kentucky uh, this year, and I'm trying to. Get, I always like the matches you promote. Well, thank you very much. Hey, if you get a chance, come to Louisville Gardens June 23rd for the uh, the Rock and Rumble. Oh, you got a big deal going there, huh? Big deal. We've talked about it the first part of the program, and I know Dave's running low on time, so I'm sure he'll give everybody updates on the most important independent wrestling extravaganza of the summer oh. <laughs> as the weeks go on. Well, good deal. With, with you doing the job, I'm sure it'll be great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the show. Uh, we're subscribers to the Wrestling Observer. Uh, Thank you very I, much. I, I always it. thought it was called a cafe sheet for years, but I guess it's not. But uh, it's been called that. It's been called a lot worse than that. Here. <laughs> no. Okay, but, you guys, we are, we are like totally out of time. I want to thank Jim. Jim, I want to thank you very much for doing the show. This breezed by too quick, and and we got to get you on again real soon because I had this stack of emails. And we never even made a dent in it. And uh, anyway, we will be back Monday at six.